Hey guys, before we get started, I just want to remind you that the Get Stuff Done Shorthanded Virtual Conference is coming October 6th or the 8th. I'm letting you know this now, super early. This is an uncharted conference that is it's my baby. I love it. Um, I've been very involved with it. Um, I will be very involved with it going on. Uh, it is a very interactive conference. It does not sit and just have webinars on. This is small group, discussion group. We make a big chunk of the conference content on the first day of the conference where we figure out what people want to do. And then we make that happen in the back part of the conference. It is very much for attendees, by attendees. It is all about getting things done when you're shorthanded, when you're feeling overwhelmed. And I know that some of you guys are. So anyway, I'm going to put a link down in the show notes. Check it out below. I'd love to see you there. You just get signed up and then we'll keep you posted and let you know when registration opens. But October 6th through the 8th, virtual conference. That's all I got for you. I'm going to link in the show notes. Welcome, everybody, to the Kona Shame Veterinary Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Andy Rourke. Guys, I am here today with one of my best friends in the world, Dr. Mary Gardner. This is a um, this is an interesting episode. It's a long one uh, for us. It's, it's about 40 minutes, uh, Mary and I talk, but we talk about the morality and the ethics of euthanasia, and we talk about convenience euthanasia, and we talk about economic euthanasia, and we talk about uh, behavioral euthanasia, like uh, reactivity in pets or aggression, uh, whatever people uh, want to call it or imagine it as uh things like that but we we talk a lot about the hard euthanasia cases and guys i took a lot away from this episode i love mary's perspective i think she's so interesting and she uh she's an amazing storyteller amazing lecturer but uh she she geeks me out and so you're gonna hear us uh st- talking over each other probably and but you're gonna hear us tell a lot of stories but um man this is a great episode i'll be listening back to uh probably a couple of times so anyway guys without further ado let's get into it this is your show we're glad you're here we want to help you in your veterinary career welcome to the cone of shame with dr andy rourke Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Mary Gardner. Thanks for being here. Hi, Andy. Thanks for having me again. I love having you on the podcast. <laughs> You're one of my well, people. People should know you are one of my best friends in uh, in in the world in real life. Um, for those who do not know, the one and only Dr. Mary Gardner. She is a co-founder of Lap of Love Pet Hospice, which is a behemoth of a company. Uh, that I'm looking at you in your office, and you have your entrepreneur magazine that you were featured in up on the wall it's uh it's that level of of success you are uh you're a veterinarian you and i went to vet school together yes. we graduated in the same class love it uh, we sat together in the back of the room and um yeah we have been dear friends ever since you are one of the best lecturers in veterinary medicine in america and i say that in all sincerity and uh you are genuinely a hilarious funny person who i deeply enjoy talking to. So I uh, I always love having you here. Thanks for being Same here. Same back. And I love it when I see you in my lectures, which is always oh, fun. Oh yeah, I I 100% come come and sit in your like honestly, there's there's uh, like let me let that be the high praise that it is. Is you know, I go to conferences and I I I'm busy and there's I I don't sit in on a lot of lectures at big conferences, but I but I come and sit in on your lectures cuz you're that good oh. and you should you should be I really I was sitting yours uh, but I can't wait in the lines. <laughs> can i get a backstage i want like speaker oh. assistant tag <laughs> oh my face is red that was well played all right hey, let's Good. now that we've let's fluffed our on. pillows yeah. enough let's let's move on uh, okay so let me also i bring up i bring up the how much i love you and, and and how we uh and how we like to joke together because we are doing a um we're doing a a sensitive topic podcast but it is in our nature to just to talk and to be honest and and to kind of uh, sometimes you laugh because you don't want to cry. And so people, what they should know going into this podcast is we're going to talk about some heavy stuff, but you'll probably hear us also, uh, you know, be very matter of fact about it and go back and forth. If that's upsetting, now is the time to delete this podcast and listen instead to, um, I don't know, whatever. Headspace. I don't But like, Headspa- uh, yeah. No, this is a very whatever good disclaimer because I've gotten very nasty comments just on oh you smile while you're talking about pet loss or you're yeah and you know you laugh and things like that so you just you can't make everyone happy right well i've gotten those too they're generally when pet owners are there you know what i mean like if i do a youtube video 
And it's about anything that has to do with pet with pain in pets. If I if I if I'm smiling about so even if I take a take a, a side step and tell a, a funny story on the side, they're like, "How did you? How, you? how could you possibly tell a funny story During while you're time. talking about this?" And, and again, I, I I get it. I think uh, anyone who's been in vet medicine for some time has got some pretty good coping mechanisms yeah. and can compartmentalize pretty well. Pretty I much. think that is a a learned skill. So anyway, I I I want I thought of it early on. It's like I better give that disclaimer because I don't I don't plan to have a deep. <laughs> emotional conversation with Mary. And at the same time, we're gonna I'm gonna we ask will. you some heavy stuff. Yeah. All right. Okay. Cool. So here's here's what I've got for you. Um, and this is just this is this is not a specific case, but this is a general headspace that I wrestle with a lot. Okay, so a couple of things are happening here. And this may be too big to really get all the way into uh the way I want. I'm gonna have to get you back. So I'm looking at a, at a couple of things here, right? So I'm looking at the rising cost of pet care, uh, the uh, inflation. So just take it off of off of vet medicine. Just be, man, inflation is real. Yep. And and salaries for vet professionals is going up, which is good. It needs to happen. But at some point, there's not a magic money tree, right? This is all coming around from somewhere. There's private equity groups that are buying vet hospitals, and they're not buying them out of the kindness of their heart. They're these are investment properties, and mm-hmm. they're expecting to make money off of them. And so I'm looking at a lot of things and say, oh man. I'm seeing, you know, the cost of care going up and things like that. And so I was thinking through and I go, well, what does this mean? Well, at some point, I think it might affect the behavior of pet owners. There may be people who don't get pets mm-hmm. if they can't afford them. And I don't like that. And I'm working to try to with everybody else to try to figure out how to make that not happen. But, uh, you know, one of the things we've seen in the past and, and I also add into this, we very likely are heading into a recession in this country. And what does a recession mean for pet care? Well, it means that some people can't afford to do things they could have otherwise done. And so I always worry or wonder, are these things going to come back around to things like economic euthanasia? Um, mm-hmm. And so that, that's that's part of this. The other part, you know, so I think about that and go, well, what does that mean? And, and what is my role in this when we talk about euthanasia? And the other part is I, I, as behavioral euthanasia. And these are these are sort of related and not related. But, you know, I have people come in and they say, well, you know, I have this dog and he's he's bitten three people um, in our house and never badly, but we can't have this person or this, this pet, you know, that we can't trust or, or you have people who come in and they say, you know, we have uh, our, this cat won't stop peeing outside the litter box and we, we need to put them down. And that's the classic sort of behavioral euthanasia is it convenience euthanasia sort of thing. And, and mm-hmm. so I put, I put, I put these things down and they're, they're, they're different. I, I know that I'm giving you a lot of really different ex- examples, which make, make this hard for you, but I'm someone who I know I'm, I want to make this real hard. Like you're getting the mass, the master level interview here where uh, I just ask you horribly terrible questions. Um, but I, so I put these things down because I am someone who thinks deeply on, on these sort of things. And, and in the practice, I like to have some sort of philosophic guidelines and it, mm-hmm. they don't have to be perfect, but I, wh- where, where are the stepping stones where I kind of put my feet I, and I've struggled with these to even kind of figure out what lens to sort of look through and say, are there different levels of euthanasia? Are there different kinds of euthanasia? Are there different morality levels of euthanasia? Uh, what, how do, help, me, help me navigate that. And so I'm going to start with that big, wide open question of, are, are, there, are there different kinds of euthanasia? And are there different moralities in, in euthanasia? And, and kind of how do you start to parse those things apart? Oh, okay. Uh, so, yes. I do believe there's different levels. And I think our it's hard for us to pillow our head at night for some of them. Then there's some that, you know, we're like, yep, we're we we we're ready to do this. And then there's also times where we want to do a euthanasia and an owner doesn't want to do it yet because they're yeah. right, they're they're on denial island or just, you know, they love their pet and they don't want to say goodbye. So yeah. I so we we kind of break it down into four categories. The first type of euthanasia is the imminent ish <laughs> medical okay. euthanasia, right? So I say ish. Yep. So you've got, yeah. a, a, you know, a dog that's got end stage kidney failure, uh, you know, cognitive dysfunction, whatever. And you might be able to still continue, but he's got, he's a jalopy, right? So got a lot of stuff going on and we're okay with that. Now, still in that, in that, in that one, there's still a period of subjectivity that I think a lot sure. of vets struggle with. Well, is he that bad? Can we do more? Could we go further? And they may not know the struggles that are going on at home. Like, right. you know, why, you know, why were you late to this podcast, Andy? Because you had to yeah, deal with my, this poop. My dog and my dog yarked in. Oh, yeah. 
he, he uh, yarked upstairs he and yarked I had upstairs. to clean it up and I was late Great. for the podcast with Mary Gardner. <laughs> yep. But like, no it's one knows lot. my struggles. No one knows the struggles that go on at home. And if you've got a dog that's incontinent or a cat that's throwing up all over and you know they come into the clinic and they look not so bad, we can put our judging hats on. But uh, so, so those are, but typically those are the ones that we can wrap our mind around and we're okay euthanizing a dog or cat with a terminal illness or, you know, very old dog and cat with problems. The second type is the non-eminent medical euthanasia. And I think we start to struggle with these because they're recently diagnosed. They're, you know, the owners are managing it, but they want to say goodbye. So uh, the, uh, the classic one is a diabetic cat or dog. Okay. And the owner doesn't want to give the meds. They can't afford the meds. And, and we know if it's not managed, it will get bad. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I put, I put like Cushing's disease into this a lot because it'll, it'll be, it's an expensive treatment and the, the vet's panting and peeing everywhere. And, and, and there's no, if I, if the owner's like, look, we're, we can't do this. And I'm like, I don't see how this gets better. I I can, that, that's the non-imminent for me. I I think I've made, I think I've made peace with, with those. And I also, I think that's, that's a great way to look at it. That, that totally makes sense. I'm, I'm right here with you. Yeah. And I had three dogs with. With Cushing's. I wish I paid more attention to Dr. Cher because I yeah. I learned <laughs> so much just from my own animals and the struggles and the, you know, the trilistine dosing and that, da, 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 da. like it was a lot. And it's okay to say goodbye to a dog, you know, that's, you know, are they healthy? They've got Cushing's, but, you know, sometimes yeah. we don't see how, you know, how they will get worse and what they're going through right now. Right. So I'm also with you. I'm okay. Does it suck sometimes? Yeah. And Cushing's is, Cushing's is almost a, a little bit easier for us to manage, yeah. right? Let's talk about the diabetic cat, right? It's just a oh. little wee needle, fifty bucks a month. Well, but I got, I got, I've got another one for you. It's the, um, it's the happy arthritic dog. That one is a dagger in my heart. I hate it so much when they like they eat, they bright eyed, but they can't get up. They can't, they can't yep. keep themselves clean. The owner can't get them down the stairs. Like, and and you see their mobility going down, and like, oh. That one, that's the one that just, oh, it bleeds it, me. It's that it was so my hard. Heart too. It breaks my heart too. And, and those owners that, you know, you can't just say, well, throw a yoga mat around and you're fine. It's, it's so much more than that. Right. Yeah. So that's yeah, so, it's so much more. And they, and they, and of course the owners are, are struggling with this so mightily. Anyway, I, okay. I, I'm, so that's I'm telling you, so those, two, non-eminent. those two, I think eminent and non-eminent, non-eminent can, can be a struggle for some teammates though. And they're like, yes. Dr. Rourke. But this cat, though, it's an orange tabby, and he's so cute. We could rehome him. Somebody will take care of a diabetic cat, yeah. right? Or a Cushing's dog. Or I had a Cushing's, you know, that whole story. Yep. Mm-hmm. Then there are two others. And okay. uh, the other one is a non-medical euthanasia. So the behavioral issues. Um, and then before we talk more about that, let me jump to the fourth one. Then there's truly convenience euthanasia, where I simply do not want this animal anymore. I, yeah. I, and I'm moving, I can't, whatever it may be, I, you know, we all hear the story of they don't match the couch and that's going to happen like once maybe in our lifetime. I doubt any of us are really going to hear those, but those are so rare, Andy, that someone yeah. comes to your office and says, I don't want this animal anymore. If that's right. their mentality, they're dumping them off somewhere. They're putting it at the shelter. I've had yeah. a lot of people that maybe older pets, maybe 10, let's say, and they're like, we're moving. He's like, I can't take the animal and I know it's better to euthanize him than live in a shelter. Now, is that convenient? Or, you know, everybody will say, well, you should only move to a place where you can take your animal, right? Well, what if Uh, if you're going through a divorce, you're, you're got no bill. The only part that you can find doesn't take them or it's a breed that they don't take. Like whatever the story is, it's not always easy to move with your animals. So yeah. Those are tough, but those are so rare. And, and I don't ever do a convenience euthanasia, but I will help. So if I've got a dog that is a 12 year old, you know, Rottweiler and they want them euthanized, I'm going to find the Rottweiler rescue in my area or around you gotcha. know, and hook them up Yeah, because there are people that will, that will, but you have to be careful when you say no, what the consequences are of saying no. Well, I just, well, yeah, I, I, and I hate to even bring this up, but we've all, we've all heard the, the thing of, if you don't do it, then, you know, then I'll shoot them or something right. horrible. And it's, it's been a long time since I've heard that, but I've heard that more than once in my career. And you go, and again, like that's, you anyway, know, I can, I, we could, we could go off on a big tangent on that and I don't yes. want to, but, um, but we've all heard those things and, and it does make you think through like, well, what, what are my real options here? And, and what are these outcomes? And that's, that is challenging. It is. So now let's go back to that third one. So behavior. 
And there's different types of behavior issues. So there's untrained animals. So dogs that are just crazy jumping up and a pain in the ass. (laughs) Sure. I I have one upstairs uh, that matches this 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 description. description. Yes. Yeah. Then there are reactive dogs. So many of us say, you know, aggressive dogs, biting, uh, um, just lunging, uh, maybe just to certain people, certain situations, another cat in the house, another dog in the house, things like Mm -hmm. that. I'm going to start this whole conversation with, it sucks, but I will use the nice dose. And it has taken me though years to get there without being upset over it. Because you go there and sometimes they're sweet and they're nice. And you're like, well, this dog wouldn't hurt a fly. Yet if that yeah. cat moseyed out, like they would kill him. They, yeah. you, it's so interesting behavior euthanasia. And, and owners, typically owners, listen, 90% of owners are going to come to us because they're, they're desperate. They need help. Are there mm-hmm. some of those butthead owners that are just like, yes, yep. you can parse those out usually. Yeah, totally. They're frustrated. They've tried stuff. What happens though in our world is what is our immediate response to that? And these people have probably had this this pet for a year or more. And everyone says, well, you need to go see a behavioralist. You need to go see a trainer. Have you tried positive reinforcement? Have you tried, you know, separating the animals? Have you tried drugs? All these things. And that's a lot. It's a a lot to to put on some people. And I've come to realize that behavior is a mental illness. Like it is, mental illness is an illness. They've got anxiety. Mm -hmm. They've got something that is triggering them. And what helped me explain with this even better is my current dog. So I've always had perfection dogs. All my Dobermans, they're always awesome. My Savoy is great. So when my last Doberman died, I went and got this dog. <laughs> Norin is I, his name. I'm, I'm pausing here for a second because you say you've always had awesome Dobermans. And I have to admit that you do have awesome Dobermans. And I know because one of them could have killed me one time when I, I don't know if you remember this. And just as a side, you had uh, me and, and Allison, my wife, and some other people over at dinner at your oh, yes. house in, in Gainesville, Florida. And I left to go do something. I left something in my car. I, I went away and I came back and I said, I'll just let myself in because I know they're in there having dinner. And I opened the back door into like the mudroom yes. and Neo, Neo, the Doberman Pinscher, just he walks into this dark room with his ears sticking straight up. And he just looked at me and I saw the end of my life there. And I was going, hey, Neo, it's me, your buddy, Andy. I saw you earlier tonight. <laughs> and uh, and you overheard and came to save me. But uh, yeah, he was an impressive animal. And I'll never forget letting myself into the dark room <laughs> and seeing the silhouette shadow outline of Neo, oh, Neo. looking at me from the doorway. <laughs> I was like, oh, I have made a terrible miscalculation. <laughs> yeah, okay. listen, but he was wonderful. So uh, he sorry, was wonderful. Go ahead, go ahead. And he would be protecting of me. So like, oh. <laughs> just like many Bichons would. <laughs> he, sure. could, he could just do damage. So I've always had very, uh, you know, g- great dogs. So we, I adopted this dog, Norin, a couple of years ago. And the moment I saw him, I knew he was, he was trouble. Like, he has one blue eye, like, uh, you know, the blue eyes just tell you they're, they're crazy. He's got a, he's got a magic crazy eye, right? And I'm like, I imagine them being different sizes. I know that's not true, but he just, when you said that, it, it, it looks, reminds me of, it yeah. looks different. So, you know, Dennis thought he'd be perfect. And I'm like, that dog's got issues. I could tell this is behavior or whatever. Luckily we introduced him to my dog, Sam, who was like Eeyore, like nothing bothers her. Like, oh, she's like 13, has cancer, dying. Like she's no, no, no problem. Little did we know he wanted to kill everything else. And oh, wow. so we have a cat. He wanted to kill the cat going for walks. He was like a gator. Like he, it was hor- He's killed rabbits in the house. He's got anxiety. When we left, it was scratching at the door. Like it was oh, man. full on behavior problems. And yeah. it was so stressful. Every day I'd leave, I'd have my cat, you know, in another ho- side of the house. I'd have to make, and I'm worried, can he get through the door? I'd have to barricade the door. The stress and anxiety that this dog brought to me was in like uh, unmeasurable. It was, it was, it was insane. And we were in the fourth home. So oh, wow. it's not easy to find someone to deal with this. And he was great. Didn't chew on things, didn't poop anywhere. Like he was a great dog, but he had anxiety. So I was, I was lucky enough to afford the cost and the time to go see a behavioralist. And when I say the time, because it's not just the money, it is time yeah. and patience. Mm-hmm. It's in commitment and to keep commitment. doing it. Yeah, it, it is hard. So we went and saw uh, Lisa Radosta. 
Oh, she's and great. She's great. She's been on the podcast a couple of times. Yeah, she's great. If she can't help you, no one can, right? Yeah. It's like, oh, you're going to the best. Yeah. I'm going to the best. So she's like, he needs to be on meds. And then, of course, you know, Dennis didn't want him on meds. It's like this whole big thing. And so and she's like, yeah, do positive reinforcement. Leave it. Leave it. All this stuff. It was a, a hell year. Like, I, I was near euthanasia like three times. Wow. It was really bad. The drugs were so helpful, but it's patience. And I ran out of it a lot of times. And the, the anxiety I've had, if I can't handle it, mm-hmm. no one can. And I know he's anxious. Like he's, And she's like, it's reactive. It's, it's not aggression. It's reactive. So I learned so much. But not everybody can afford that to go see Elisa Rodasta. And us doctors yeah. aren't like the best at d- dealing with behavior. We'll, we'll put them on reconcile and, and fingers crossed. That's enough. Right. But there's a lot to this. And so she taught me tips and tips and tricks. So we're three years in, he's still alive. But I got to be honest, I, I wish I could find a home for him that is just, just him alone where he could yeah, be just him, just him. Because I, ha- yeah. I can, my cat has been a prisoner for three years and I can't get anybody else. Sam is long gone. And I yep. can't get any other pets because of him. And I, I can't bring him to the beach. I can't bring him to a dog park. Walking yeah. is a pain. It's, it's hard. So understanding that now has, as, as bad as it is, I, I would have euthanized him and I would have helped a family do that, but it sucks. Yeah. That, that, that's really interesting. I had not thought of this as, uh, I had not, I had not thought of reactivity as mental illness yeah. and that's, that's interesting. And so that's that's exactly the type of philosophic sort of framework I, I was looking for. I had not put that together. But but yeah, sort of following those steps is reactivity is often uh, anxiety, um, you know, fear, things like that at, at a pathological level. So mental illness, uh, we know that mental illness is an illness. And at that point, I go, OK, well, I'm walking up to this point where we we have this pet that's ill, that is not responding to treatment and is negatively impacting, especially to the point where people are getting injured or we're afraid for the lives of other animals. That's super, that's super helpful. And just think if, if a family has a Cushing's dog that doesn't want to try trilostane for whatever yeah. reason, are we okay euthanizing them? Okay. Yeah, that, that's yes. exactly what we were talking about before. As I'm like, yeah, well, you know, yeah. this is I get I, we know where this is going, and and yeah, we're okay with it. We're um, okay with it. What about if a family doesn't want to do reconcile and training and all and behavior and things like that? I mean, it's it's a commitment, and they don't have yeah. the time, energy, you know, emotional capacity, finances to do it. Reconcile is not free, right? So, like, I'm okay doing it. Uh, it's 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 hard though. Now there are some true Prujos out there that are just like. Oh, yeah. There are some that make it that, that you just go like they're terrifying and you say, oh, I Correct. I see this as a, as a benefit to society. It's good for the dog. Yes. It's, it's this is someone's going to get badly hurt here. Yes. And I think that's every we all know it. Right. So right. Um, I think those are those are easier for us to do. It's these it's it's the Norans out there that have a history that, you know, uh, and he's bitten a few people and you know so he's on the list. <laughs> so yeah. And I can't travel. Oh, guess what? Going anywhere. I got to find a boarding facility that could specially handle him. And now I got to worry about him hurting other dogs. And like, it's, it's so it's intense and it it takes a lot. So if any listeners would like a monogamous relationship with a pointer mix, (laughs) email me. Ideally, yeah. Do you live in, do you live in a farm somewhere uh, that you don't want people to come visit you? Uh, We got you. Yeah. Yeah. We got, if you're like, I'm done with I'm done with people. Uh, we can we can help you make that a more permanent can, state. Right. But he's great. So these are tough. And, you know, we we do about, I think it's about 2% of, of the families that we help at Lap of Love. And we help over 100,000 a year. So it's a lot. But 2%, 2% is behavior euthanasia. Yeah. And wow. And there, it's on the spectrum of Cujo's to, mm-hmm. the, to like a Norin. And yeah, a lot of our vets struggle with it. And our biggest key is you got to go talk to the family. Yes. You ha- you yeah. can't say no until you talk to that family and you sit in their house and you see their fear or you sit in the clinic and talk to them, feel their frustration and understand it. And you know what? If they are just those you know few percent that are flippant 
silly. Like you don't have to, but understand what no means. Yeah, that that's really good advice. I, I really appreciate that. Hey guys, I just want to jump in here real fast and give a shout out to Banfield the Pet Hospital for making our transcripts available. That's right, we have transcripts for the Kona Shame Vet Podcast and the Uncharted Veterinary Podcast. You can find them at drandyrook.com and at unchartedvet.com. This is a uh, part of their effort to increase inclusivity and accessibility in vet medicine. We couldn't do it without them. I gotta say thanks. Thanks for uh, for making the the content that we put out more available to our colleagues, guys. That's all I got this time. Let's get back into this. So let me um, let me jump back here uh, a little bit and say um, we talked. So I talked at the very top about about um, economic euthanasia mm. and talked mm-hmm. about uh, you know when when we have someone who says oh you know i can't i can't afford this service or things like that and i know these are these are different waters but i think that what we just talked about with with behavioral and reactivity i think that, that was really i think that was really helpful for me and and you've clearly thought these sort of things through do you have do you have thoughts on on how economics uh economic euthanasia is the impact that they have on doctors or or their mental checklists that you run through in that regard you know it's t- it's tough because You'll hear people all the time say, if you can't afford the animal, you shouldn't get one, right? Which oh, man, yeah. I can't stand that, actually, because I think we would have a lot more people, animals in the shelter if that was... I so Okay, so hold on. This is really okay. interesting. Okay, so I've been thinking a lot about this in the last couple of, of days and weeks because I have seen a resurgence of this comment of, if you don't want animal, or if you can't afford an animal, you shouldn't have it, okay? And, and people go, well, I can't believe anyone would say that. And of course, I, I, I don't believe in that. And I think that, that that lacks empathy when we say it. And I understand why doctors say it. It's because we're frustrated and we want to not feel like we're the bad guys. And so being we we like to sort of shift the blame and say, how dare you get mad at me? Right. You're the one who who has this responsibility that that you're struggling to pay with. Why why do I feel terrible? I didn't have anything to do with this. And it's funny because there's this balance, right? There's the if you don't uh, if you can't afford a pet, you shouldn't have one. And I think most of us go, ooh, that's not good. But if I flip it around and say, do you believe that we have a responsibility to take care of pets that we take on? I think most of us would say, yes, we do have that. Yes, but where and, is and, that line, though? What? And that's the that, interesting part. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, I just, I've been thinking a lot about that. Okay, good. So it's shelter, it's love, it's food and water, right? Like that's the basics that we all have to be able to give or else you shouldn't have that animal. Yeah. Do we have to, what if they can't afford, I mean, and you know, heart, heart prevention, maybe vaccinate, you know, like some very basic care, but if they can't afford the trial estate or they can't afford yeah. like $50 to some people is a lot. Right. So, yeah. um, I think you probably sat in my lectures once when I would be like, who's got a thousand bucks that could just hang out with me for the weekend. Right. Yeah. Just plop it down. Just yeah. plop it down. We could just go hang out. And like, nobody raises their hand. And I said, well, that's what, a sick animal for for figuring out what's wrong with them, getting them, you know, actually blood or whatever is a thousand bucks. Fifty one percent of the pep population of America do not have over a thousand dollars in savings. They don't yeah. have it. And as and yeah. should we say care credit and credit cards and stuff like that? Well, that's debt. And now we're adding more debt. Okay. So I think for us just to say, if you can't afford more than the basics, you shouldn't own an animal. That would be great if we had a a, a lack of animals in the world, right? right? So only if you yeah. can afford. Oh, yeah. Five hundred dollars a month, and you should. We we are overpopulated. They're out there. They're yeah. needed. So you know we need homes for them. What's the line, though? Well, and and that's funny too. So so hold on. Let me let me let me throw another story in okay. here as well. Um. So so I I got a chance to interview the the gang who was at the uh, main veterinary emergency center that uh that had this terrible sort of cyberbullying thing oh, yes, not long ago. Yes, yes. And so, yeah, so they got, uh, basically they had, a, they had a patient that came in and uh, it, it was a, it was a young pet and it needed surgery in a bad way. Like it, it had uh, eaten a skewer, yes, that's right. you know, like a wooden skewer. And the, the, the story was basically this thing had done horrific internal damage, you know, like through the perf, lungs, per, like yeah, exactly right. Perf the stomach, skewered the liver into the, there's, yeah, it's pure. It yeah, pure. it did. It did what it was made to do. Um, but it, you know, and it's got it's got pyothorax. It's it's got it's sepsis from a leaky abdomen. It was a ten thousand dollar surgery minimum to fix this pet going in, and you might have a thousand dollars laying around. You might have five thousand dollars laying around. 
there's not a lot of us that have $10,000. And so even to me, and as, as I think about where is this line, I'm going, it's just an interesting question. Do I feel differently about a pet that needs a $3,000 surgery right. and a pet that needs a $10,000 surgery? What's and I'm line? kind of like, one of them seems farther from, you know, from we can just do this, you know, and make this happen. Uh, you know, uh, then, then the other one does is right. like, is there a difference in saying your pet needs a $500 procedure versus your pet needs a $5,000 procedure? And that changes how I feel about this. I, I again, these are it's all deep, questions I right? ask myself. Yeah, it, it really is. But if we didn't used to have $10,000 procedures, Mary, like when you and I came out of vet school, like that was unheard of. Unheard I remember the first time I heard, I remember the first time I heard someone say, these people spent $10,000 on this pet. And I was like, Oh my God. Uh, right. And, what? And I, I, I actually have a friend, friends of mine, uh, in, in, in school, they had a Doberman that came to the, to the clinic had, uh, had a 30% body burns. And, uh, and of course everyone knew I loved Doberman. So Mary got the case and it was yeah. like two months in the clinic. They spent like $20,000, something crazy like that. And I, and I remember asking them like, like, it's, it's okay to say no, like, it's okay. And, and they're like, we'll make more money, but this is our dog. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. And, I get and, it. and, but that's, but it's okay. Also, if they said no, and where that's is the, yeah. that, where is that line? And I, I can go deep on Like, I don't even know what the answer is. I, I, and I think oh. that's the point is there isn't an answer. I think I get upset if someone pays money for their dog, they pay mm -hmm. $2,000 for a freaking Yorkie or whatever. Yeah. And then they can't afford a $2,000 surgery. I think that's where mm. Mary's, Mary's like, uh, <laughs> like that's where my line is. If you yeah. adopted a dog for 150 bucks and you gave it a couple of years of great life and food and kibble and whatever, and now all of a sudden you can't afford a $500 block. Oh, I'm yeah. okay. Like I get it. Well, I'm okay. Yeah. Like, that, that dog got five years of life that a lot of other dogs in the shelter or that don't make it to the shelter would, would not have gotten. Got and I go, okay, it's funny. Um, yes, that dog didn't get the life it would have if it had, if it was in a home where there were people who had, you know, a budget, a bajillion dollars right. laying around. But, but most of us are in that home. And you know what I mean, and you sort of say, well, um, I don't know. It's just, it's really, it's really interesting to sort of say, where is, where, where is that line where you say, yeah. I, this is what I could do. And I, and I took care of this dog in, in, in a, in a health state. And the fact that this dog could theoretically live on if I had $12,000 to spend on surgery, that doesn't matter because I don't have $12,000 and I shouldn't feel bad about it. And, and the people who do have $12,000, they shouldn't feel bad about it either. Correct. But it, you know, I, I don't want to hold those. Just I don't, because those we two can people doesn't are different. mean we should, right? Yeah. You know, what's so interesting too, is I've done so much for my animals and so many veterinarians have said to me, like, well, like that seems excessive. You know, you did radiation and chemo and da, 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 da. and so it, it's interesting because I'm like, well, what if I didn't do it, would you judge me then too? Oh yeah. Right? And you get the person, the family that's like, I don't want to put my cat through, you know, chemo with lymphoma. Like, well, they actually have a really good, you know, response rate to it. Well, I, I don't want to put them through that. But then then you do put a cat in chemo and people are judging you then too. Like, what are you doing to that yeah. cat? It's just a cat. You can't win. Like, yeah, you can't win. You can't win. That's, can't it's win. true. Yeah, it's true. It's just, it's it's just true. It's just crazy. Now, let me let me talk about this peen cat that you took. Okay. Yeah. Let's yeah. do. Yeah. And that's right. Who here wants a cat that this is all over their house? No yeah, one. No. I, I, no. No one wants that, right? That's a huge issue. And but so I I I want to I want to read something to you. But before I do, I remember you sat in my lecture, and I think it was okay. this 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 lecture that I do, I'm like, what would you do? And I go over like mm -hmm. yeah. seven cases from the urinator to the untrained dog, to the reactive dog, to the, to the mobile, the arthritic, but still okay dog. Like, so we, we just go through cases. I, I think I'm doing it again at BMX and it's just a good interactive one. Anyway, so you came up yeah. after me afterwards and you were just like, we put so much pressure on our staff sometimes that we don't realize that Okay, Mary loves Dobermans. So guess what? If we've got mm -hmm. the diabetic Doberman that came in, guess who's getting a phone yeah. call to adopt this dog? And the guilt we place on each other, we have to be careful of. Yeah. We've got some staff members that have got 12 cats at home because yeah. they can't say no. And I think it is really good to have this open conversation with the team to say, where are our lines? 
And, yeah. and don't judge somebody. If Mary is okay euthanizing a, a reactive dog, don't judge her. This is why she thinks this way. But so I found this on, uh, on, a, on a Facebook group and it was a veterinarian talking about this pet. I don't know if it's a dog or cat. I'll see in a second. But she said, she is peeing on things randomly. Pillows on my bed, her bed, the carpet, etc. I'm at the end of my ropes. I didn't want a dog when I adopted her, but I was kind of guilted into taking her on by my coworkers at my old job. I'm so frustrated. Yeah. She's really a sweet dog, but she has something bad and it makes her hard to rehome. And I can't really afford to just do every test there is with no guarantee that we'll find out what's wrong and treating it. Yeah. Like a cat or dog that's peeing, you know, especially a dog, there's something wrong. It's probably not just training, right? Yeah. That to me is a medical issue. And if we can't figure it out, it's like, I'm okay. Do I want to figure it out? Yes, but we can. And you know, um, our, our good friend, Megan, uh, Megan Brashears, who yeah. I just adore her. Yeah, so she's, she's amazing. She said a quote once, uh, do not shoulder the responsibility of the health and safety of every animal in this world. <laughs> Some people, I know people who should have that, should, who should have that tattooed on their body. Right. Like, uh, yeah. like this should be in a clinic everywhere. Do not yeah. shoulder the responsibility of the health and safety of every animal in the world. We do what we can. And so when I, when I lecture on euthanasia, I say, I can't always be in control of why, but I can be in control of how, and I will do a really good euthanasia. I will make sure that pet, and, and, and it sucks because sometimes I want to take them all. I want to take all the Dobermans and the orange cats and the black cats, and you know, I can handle it, but I can't also, I can't do it. And I yeah. have to pillow my head at night and I just, I don't take on the guilt that I, sh that's not mine. Yeah. I, I, I agree with that. I think, um, it's funny. I've been thinking a lot more kind of about, and I don't know if we're really, if we're really going to go this way. I think the future of, I always said the future of vet medicine is fragmentation. And I, I look a lot at you and, uh, and Mary and kind of what you've done or you and, uh, Danny and kind of what you guys have done with Laugh of Love as, as one of the key pieces of that early on in my career. That's all. When I say that the future of vet medicine is fragmentation, what I mean is I think we're all going to do different things before long, meaning there will be pet hospice. There will be, uh, I, some of us will just do recovery and rehabilitation. There will be the mega bougie, 24 seven places. And then there'll be the concierge vets who don't have an office. They just go to people's houses, yep. and, you know, and like, I think it's going to be, there's going to be some low cost, um, high volume places and some low volume, high cost places. And I, that's not bad because then people can kind of sort to where they want to be and we can get support for people who need it in, in like financially and things like that. I think that's all, that's all good. Um, but it's just as I as I start to think about about medicine, where we're going, especially uh, recession, things like that. I do wonder at some point if we we need to look more at almost like shelter medicine and start to think at what point do we start to think of ourselves doing herd health almost where you say, I can't fix all the pets and I need to I need to own that I can't fix all the pets. I have a flock who are my clients pets who I try to take care of. And I need to maintain myself so that I can keep going. But part of the herd health is to say some of the, some of these uh, pets are, are not going to we're not going to be able to save them all. And the, the, the goal is not to save them all. The goal is to look at all the good that I do and all the work that I do and achieve the optimal outcome, not the maximum outcomes in, in every case. And that's it's an interesting philosophy. But you have to you have to switch away from eye, eye to eye contact with the pet over in the room with the pet owner in the room and switch it more to looking at everything that I do and my career and how I'm going to have boundaries and 100%. sleep at night and not burn out. Like that is so well said. And you know what? It's okay to remember some things, right? I, I remember Dee Dee, the, the very aggressive Rottweiler that wanted to kill me. But, you know, and I, I just used that. But, but you know what was great about Dee Dee? It was, it was peaceful. It was good. I still did it well. You know, yeah. could it have been different? Yeah, but you're right. My The net, result of all that we do is so good that do not let these live stories in your mind that you can't then escape from. And, yeah. and it's, and it's tough. It, it's, these are our very difficult decisions. We love, we love animals, you know, like that's why, that's why I became a vet. I love animals. I'll say, it, right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and, yeah. And I love the families that love them too, but we can't be everything. We can't, we can't. I've got this idea. I've tried, I tried to write it one time and I, I think it bombed. I don't think it's funny. I think it, I, either, either no one read it or they read it and they were kind enough to not mention it to me. Um, but I got this, I got this idea. I call it the paradox of the, um, the paradox of the special pet is the idea. 
And so in order to be in vet medicine, right, you have to be able to hold these two conflicting views in your head at the same time, I think. So here it is. All right. So the paradox of the special pet, you have to be able to look at a pet and realize that that pet is the center of the world for that person, right? They are a special pet. And then at the same time, in order to keep your brain and not burn out, you have to also be able to look at that pet and know that there are an endless number of other pets out there in the world that need care, that need homes, you know, that, um, that, that would be wonderful for any of us to have. And so that pet is not special because there's a million other pets. And also pets don't live very long. In the best case circumstances, they don't live very long. And so we have to be able to look at two completely contradictory views, one being every pet is deeply special and every single pet is not deeply special because there is an unending stream of sick pets and well pets that need homes. And we are looking at one little drop of water in the ocean. And I think that if you can hold both of those things in your head at the same time, you can be happy in vet medicine. I, I think so. And if you can't hold them both in your mind, I think that one way or another, you're going to have pain that you're going to have to figure out how to manage. Yeah. No, I, I, I would have read that instead of having my friend. Oh, well, thank you very I, much. I, because I, I think it's good. You know what? And look how I started talking about my dog, Norrin. And I said, I can't get any other animals. I would yeah. adopt five more animals right now. Yes. I can't yeah. because of him, right? Like I can't. And, uh, you know, it, it's, there are so many out there and I think we could do probably, I think we, I think it would be very helpful to talk to other, other industries like child services, right? Th those people yeah. who work in child services, how horrible is their job to see oh, children God, yeah. that they have to leave in a house that they're, you know, abused and stuff like, like their minds must be so bad too. <laughs> oh so, man. I, you know, when we went to, we've, we've gone through this thing in the last couple of years and, and people were talking about, you know, that medicine is horrible. Um, and, and, and vet medicine is uniquely challenging. It is, a, it is a hard profession, and we both know it, and burnout is a real problem, and, and mental health and wellness is a real problem. Um, I don't believe that we own the market on unhappiness, on stress, on yeah. emotional burnout, because I have two friends that are in DSS, and I don't know how you go and take kids away from their families or how you go and not take kids away from their families, given some of the things that these people see. I, I don't know how you do it. I have a friend who is a, uh, a pediatric palliative care specialist. Oh, like, uh, she, she manages pain in children with cancer and other illness. And I'm like, I'm sorry, buddy. I, 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 don't ha I don't know that I would ever have the emotional fortitude. And I'm, uh, yeah, exactly, to do, to do what you do. And I've, I've, I do fairly well with this, but I'm like, I just, I don't, I don't know how other people do it. So I think that there's lots of other people. Yeah. They're, right. We don't have the market on anxiety on like yeah. it, it's, there's a lot out there. And yeah. I, I think we could learn a lot from how people manage some of these stresses and emotional, you know, tug of wars in their hearts. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. I think, I think, I think we're going to keep learning. And I think that there will, I, I do, I think as a society, I think we're going to keep learning. I think there's a lot of focus on anxiety and stress just in general. And I, I'm optimistic about the future. I, I really am. I, I don't want people to, to think that I'm down. I, this is a hard part of our job that's never going away, um, but it can be less hard. And I, I really do think that, you know, remembering your why matters a lot. Like we're doing this because we believe it's the right thing to do. And this is part of uh, delivering a good death is part of a good life. It really is. And protecting and protecting from suffering, I, I think, is often one of the kindest things that you can possibly do. Dr. Mary Gardner, thank you so much for being here. Uh, Your book uh, is, is out. We talked about it last time we were here. Uh, run me down on the title of your book again. It's called It's Never Long Enough, A Practical Guide for Caring for Your Geriatric Dog. Yes. If you guys enjoyed this conversation, check out Mary's book. We also have a podcast episode from when it came out. You can listen more about that and uh, hear more of me talking with Dr. Mary Gardner. Uh, Mary, where can people learn more about Lap of Love? Where can they find you online? Yeah. So Lap of Love is uh, just lapoflove.com, which has uh, got a lot of great resources also for veterinarians on our sedation protocols and things like that. And then, or just my website, which is Dr. Mary Gardner. All right, gang. Take care, everybody. Bye. 
And that's our episode, guys. That's what I got for you. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. Uh, as always, I love an honest review wherever you get your, uh, your uh, podcast. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button and, uh, and tune in more often. Gang, take care of yourselves. Be well. Talk to you later.